So guys, I just want to say welcome to everybody here for, for We Robot 2013. I'm so excited that you guys are all here. Um, now, you may know that this is the continuation of a conference um, at the University of Miami um, uh, School of Law that happened last year. Um, and indeed, I think that Michael's going to be talking a little bit uh, about uh, how it's going to be coming back to, to Miami next year. Um, and that uh, first conference was called um, We Robot, and the uh, subtitle was uh, Setting the Agenda. And the idea was to start, and it was actually sponsored in part by, by one of the um, founders of the Sci-Fi Channel. Um, and it, it, it ranged a whole incredible uh, long sort of a range of different, uh, different ideas and, and, and so forth. Um, and, uh, and we basically did. We, we sort of got together as a community and set, set an agenda for um, the emerging area of robotics and the law. And so this follow-on conference is going to be going on for the next couple of days. Um, we've decided to focus uh, this year a little more narrowly on the immediate commercial prospects of robotics, right? And so these are the sort of legal challenges that are happening in, in the near term. Um, and, uh, and so we have things like an industry roundtable to talk about the future of robotics. Today we're going to be talking about intellectual property, liability, and so forth. Um, we're also going to be looking at the ethical overlay, um, but we're going to be talking about pro solving problems again in the near term. Um, so for instance, we're going to talk about questions about how, how do you tell a robot when it's rude not to, it, not to leave the elevator when someone's trying to get onto the elevator, for instance, right? Or um, how, do you, how do you program a robotic car to go a reasonable speed, like a reasonably safe speed? Um, what lessons does the military use of robotics hold for the commercial robotics in the United States? Um, so I'm Ryan Kahlo, and I'm the program chair. I'm a law professor at the University of Washington. I just wanted to thank a couple people, and then I'm going to turn it over uh, to Brian to start the panel up, um, and I'm going to be emceeing th uh, throughout the day. Um, so the program committee is, um, I want to thank them first of all for, for all your help. So, so Ian uh, Kerr and, and Michael Frumkin and Leila Takayama from Willow Garage. I don't think she's here yet, but she's definitely going to be here in a little bit. Uh, Dan Siciliano, uh, same with Dan, um, who is uh, the faculty director of the Rock Center for Corporate Governance. And then Bill Smart, who's a roboticist out of Oregon. Bill actually couldn't be here for the conference because he's going to be keynoting a big robotics conference in Iran. Um, which incidentally, to me at least, suggests why we have to start to think about these issues now, because you know who is Iran, uh, but also other countries, right? And so Europe has invested a tremendous amount relative to the United States to start sorting through issues of the immediate commercial prospects of robotics. Um, I'd also like to thank, uh, take the opportunity to thank our sponsors who make this at all possible, right? So all of the, this, uh, this event uh, was made possible by, by our, our wonderful sponsors, um, and I hope that you get to know the people that are here representing these respective organizations, one of which is, um, is Microsoft. So thank you very much to Microsoft. Um, I, I think you know uh, who, who they are. Um, Ropes and Gray, the law firm, the international law firm of Ropes and Gray, and we're extremely uh, grateful for your, your support. Um, also, AUVSI, right, which is the leading uh, trade group for uh, unmanned uh, vehicle systems, has been uh, as a sponsor, and we're, we're really excited to have them as well, in part because of their wealth of knowledge over, over decades looking at these, at these issues. And finally, the Rock Center for Corporate Governance here on, at Stanford University, which sits between the law school um, and the... Um, uh, and the business school. Um, there's going to be lots of breaks today, so I hope you guys get a chance to get to know each other. I think we're going to have a lot of people coming and going uh, throughout the couple days. So um, anyway, I just uh, with that, I want to turn it over to the first first panel. And uh, Brian, if you don't mind, I'll let you introduce um, uh, introduce everybody. But thank you very much for moderating today, and, and again to Ropes and Gray. Good. Thanks very much, Ryan. Um, uh, so again, my name is Brian Bittinger. Um, I'm a partner at Ropes and Gray, and uh, my focus is on intellectual property. Uh, Talk louder or lit litigation. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm very uh, honored uh, to start things off for us this morning, and thank you all for coming. Um, I have a great panel of people uh, here today who are, are going to do most of the talking, um, and uh, let me just introduce them all to you quickly before we get started. Um, first, uh, to my immediate left is uh, Mark Lemley. Uh, Mark, many of you may already know, is uh, the William H. Newcomb Professor of Law at Stanford Law School, the Director of the Stanford Program in Law, Science, and Technology, and the Director of Stanford's LLM Program in Law, Science, and Technology. 
Uh, he's the author of seven books and 133 articles and counting on intellectual property, computer and internet law, uh, patent law, antitrust, and related subjects, uh, including the two-volume treatise IP and antitrust. Uh, Mark, <coughs> Mark is also a founding partner of Drury Tangri LLP, where he litigates and counsels clients in uh, all areas of IP, uh, antitrust, and internet law. Uh, and Mark was recently named the 2013 Lawyer of the Year for Patent Litigation in San Francisco by Best Lawyers, so welcome, Mark. Uh, sitting next to Mark is uh, Julie Samuels. Julie is a staff attorney at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, uh, where she focuses on IP issues. Uh, before joining EFF, uh, Julie litigated IP and entertainment cases in Chicago at Loeb and Loeb and uh, Sun and Shine uh, Nath and Rosenthal. <clears throat> Julie has a JD from Vanderbilt University and a BS in journalism from the University of Illinois uh, at Urbana-Champaign. Welcome, Julie. I think I'm going to add one thing to Julie's resume, though, which is she has perhaps the coolest title uh, ever. Uh, she is the Mark Cuban Chair for the Elimination of Stupid Patents. <laughs> And uh, last but not least, uh, at the end of the table here is Christian Hicks. Christian is a computer scientist and co-founder of Elysium Digital. Uh, he graduated summa cum laude from Princeton University with an A.B. in computer science. Uh, before co-founding Elysium Digital, he worked as a consultant for the AT&T Consumer Lab, where he developed data mining techniques and researched internet programs and protocols. Uh, at Elysium, Christian has consulted on more than 150 matters relating to intellectual property and computer forensics, uh, and he's also a co-author of the article, Robots, the DMCA, and Patents, Threat Strategy and Case Law in the Aftermarket, uh, which is an article that he submitted in connection with this conference and will be touching on today uh, during the panel discussion, but welcome, Christian. Thank you. Um, so before we get uh, started, I'm going to try to create a dialogue here with, with some questions. The general topic is uh, robotics and IP. It's a pretty broad topic, um, so I think we'll, we'll get into a, a couple different areas um, and a lot of policy uh, questions that are, that are facing robotics uh, today or potentially facing robotics. Um, but I want to invite everybody uh, to, to, to raise your hand and ask questions as we go along. Um, no need to wait to the end of the program. Um, we'd, we'd rather keep it interactive. If, if something comes to mind, um, you know, speak up or jump up, and uh, we'll get a microphone to you and uh, try to deal with your questions as they come along. Um, so uh, I'm going to start off, Mark, um, with the first question to you. Um, and it, it's, I think, a question that sort of is going to permeate the discussion today. Um, and that is, you know, as an emerging, emerging industry, um, a growing, rapidly growing industry, um, wh what kinds of choices and particularly policy choices with respect to IP is this industry facing and uh, how best uh, ought the industry um, face these uh, questions um, or at least what ideas can we put forth for, for things that the industry should be thinking about in uh, terms of IP? Yeah, so, I, you know, I think the answer to that um, is bound up with the answer to uh, what's my uh, uh, technology model and what's my business model, right? So imagine, uh, I, you can imagine a couple of distinctions, I think, um, uh, on the technology side, they're going to drive IP distinctions. So the first is, um, is my innovation in hardware or is my innovation in software? Uh, right, and of course, in some sense, it's always going to be a combination of both. Uh, but you're going to devote your resources, perhaps, to making really cool new biomechanical stuff on the one hand, or making uh, uh, interesting software that will run on a basic uh, robotics platform on the other. Um, and that's going to drive, uh, at a very basic level, uh, how much of your IP life is influenced by patent law versus copyright law. Uh, patent law will always uh, uh, permeate your life going forward in the future. Once the IP lawyers have discovered that there's money in robotics, they will come out of the woodwork and they will visit you. Um, uh, but if your model is a software-based model, then you want to think about a kind of hybrid uh, uh, of set of issues that involve both patent 
patents, software patents, uh, but also copyright questions. The more you focus on hardware, uh, the less the copyright questions are in importance. I think that drives a second question, which is also going to be relevant for IP on the technical side, and that is, uh, am I interested in special purpose robots or general purpose robots? Right? That is, uh, do we think that the right business model is let's design a specific uh, device for a specific purpose? Uh, I developed a robotic arm which is optimized for welding the doors of cars together. Uh, or do I want uh, a, a general purpose robot that can be programmed by later people to do whatever it is uh, that they figure out they want to do. And that in turn I think is going to drive both the number of possible uh, intellectual property rights that you're going to have to contend with. Uh, you've got a lot more uh, potential patents uh, that are at issue in the general purpose world, uh, but I think it's also going to drive uh, questions about the separation between the people who are doing the content and the people who are generating or using the result. Right? So that if what I sell is a general purpose robot uh, that anyone can add a program to uh, to do certain things, <clears throat> Well, then I start to look like a little bit like I'm in the position of a of a, a Google or a smartphone manufacturer, right? Somebody who's providing a platform, providing a tool uh, that might be used for various different purposes, some of which might infringe intellectual property rights and some of which might not, and I may be separated from that decision. That is, I'm not the person who's actually deciding up front what it is this robot's going to do. And that leads to the sort of third and final uh, uh, practical business distinction, uh, which is, especially if I go the kind of general purpose, customizable, programmable robot, uh, is my model an open source model or is it a proprietary model? Um, open source model does not get you out from under IP concerns. It changes them in various respects. Uh, it changes how you approach getting your own intellectual property. Uh, it does not prevent other people, particularly patent owners, from coming after you with their intellectual property rights, uh, though it raises a series of issues that I think we can talk about in some more detail later on. But so for me, the, the question of kind of what framework of IP uh, am I faced with is, is bound up with the question of what are my robots going to look like. Right. I'm sorry. Just to, one thing to note about this is that um, the, 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 the tension that Mark has laid out here, unfortunately, is taking place in a world that is not static. And there's, there's a classic arc in, in this kind of technology, which is that you start specialized and proprietary, and the technology arcs towards commoditized and driven by software. That's been, that was true for computer science generally. If you look at, say, mainframes versus, versus where we've ended up. Um, and even in the other examples that Mark has list, listed, off, listed off, like smartphones, right now we take it for granted that the smartphone is a commoditized, basically small computer with a set, you know, with a set of particular fe uh, features and, and components that are commoditized and, and assembled and then that run some sort of generic software. But only like five years ago that was an, imp an impossible concept and each phone feature was being very laboriously custom created with electronics. And um, so that means that even if you say to yourself, okay, what sort of a framework depends, you know, what the legal framework depends on the technological reality, but the techno technological reality is going to be in an arc where, you know, patent protection is going to be more significant and more in play in the beginning, inevitably, and software is going to be driving the world, a world of, if not general purpose robots, general purpose robot components, eventually. I was just going to say, I, I really quickly, this is more thematic, I think the good news is that we're all here talking about this because there are things that a community can do to uh, make this easier for everyone and for the technology when you're talking about it from the outset. So I think, you know, as, as this conversation continues over today and frankly over the next couple of years, it's important that you all and the people in the community who are working on these technologies continue to think about this, continue to think how to work together and, and ways to kind of navigate the system so that um, we can incentivize growth in the industry. I just want to pick up on one thing that Christian said, because it's, it's right not only that technology and the business model can change over time, uh, but you've got to layer on top of that the fact that the law in this area is in substantial flux. Um, 
both in the sense that uh, we are waiting right now from the Federal Circuit definitive word. I'm not sure that there will ever actually be definitive word, but uh, somewhat more definitive word uh, on the question of uh, under what circumstances can you patent uh, software uh, when loaded in a general purpose computer? Depending on how the court answers that question, uh, the decision to make a special purpose uh, programmed robot versus a general purpose uh, robot might start to have implications for what's patentable uh, uh, at all. Um, there's also, I think, ferment on the hill because of a lot of concerns around software patents, and so it's quite plausible to me uh, to think that in the next couple of years there's legislation that's directed specifically at software patents. Again, depending on your business model, right, to the extent I take hardware, this affects me less, but to the extent the model is software driven, um, it's something that, that people have to pay attention to. How many of you are lawyers, if you don't mind me asking? Okay, and thanks. I'm just trying to get an idea. Because I think what Mark just said about particularly the case law, that's going to take probably some time. And it's going to make a huge, it has the potential to make a huge difference. So I think that's a really important point. And it might make sense to talk a little bit more about that, what that really means. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I, no, I definitely want to um, flesh out the, the software uh, patenting issue a little bit more for sure. But before I do that, I want to follow up on something, Julie, that you said about cho choices, I think, that the, the industry's facing or what the industry could, could do in this respect. And, um, <clears throat> You know, so a as uh, sort of, an, again, a, a, an industry that has, uh, is growing already and has huge potential for growth, um, it, you know, it's inevitable that people are going to be patenting um, a lot in, in, in the space, for sure. But, you know, what kind of choices um, are, are people facing or decisions could they make? For example, when you're talking about um, startup companies um, or companies that maybe don't have the resources to invest in a huge uh, patent portfolio or IP portfolio, um, you know, what are other options that, that might, the, the industry should be considering um, that would, you know, uh, move things forward in, with respect to IP and help the industry kind of grow? Yeah, okay, so I think I'll, I'll start and quickly, just to frame this a little bit, I've been doing a lot of work with the 3D printing community, which is obviously different, but... Um, what we've seen is that it's kind of split into two, and there's one group that's really patent heavy, that's trying to patent everything up, that's trying to you know, um, extract a lot of licensing fees. I, I don't like that, but it's legal, so you know, go with God. And then there's another group of people who are kind of doing all that they can to keep, keep the technology open and keep patents out of the way of development. They come more out of a kind of typical university setting. And so what we see is a natural tension there. And you've got to be careful because what ends up being all tied up by the group that's you know, more patent happy, if you will, really has implications for everyone else. So um, I think that's the natural tension that will probably also exist in this community and it will in most communities. Um, so there are a bunch of things that can be done to kind of navigate uh, uh, the, the, the framework here. One of the things is uh, talk of open licensing deals, um, whether you want to use open source licenses that are already on the market, um, that's, you know, there's tons of options there. We can talk a little bit more about that. There's, that usually exists in the copyright space, but it's moving into the patent space. And now there's some academic work, for instance, on what's called a defensive patent license, which would be where people, what, what happens is companies feel like they have to get patents because they're afraid that they're going to be sued themselves. Even if they don't want to use their patents offensively to sue anyone else, you know, they feel like their hands are tied, and so maybe they do have to go forward and get patents, if they can afford it, which is another question, and I think that's secondary. So let's, you know, this is a, a kind of a more atmospheric debate at this point. Let's say you go forward, you get a patent or two, but you don't want to use it offensively. You're just really doing this as a defensive move. Well, what can you do then to kind of draw a line in the sand and not make the problem any worse because there are really big problems right now with these patent thickets and, and kind of the world, the, the path you go down when you start patenting up, if you will. So there's ideas where you can defensively license things to each other. You know, you can use my patent, I can use yours. I will not use this patent offensively unless I actually get sued. So it kind of takes some of the teeth out of the patent. Um, and that's something that I think there are a lot of groups who are developing ideas like this out in the world, and this is positive. Um, uh, I think it's a question? Yeah. Um, well, I just wanted to ask what you think about 
Well, yeah, the question is the uh, I'm Arduino. Sorry, Arduino strategy, which is being kind of letting the open hardware out there and being really protective of the brand. So there are lots of different ways you can be protective of a brand, whether it's there are a whole host of IP ways. But I mean, take, for instance, Google, which has been really protective of its brand, mostly by in the early days using trade secret instead of patent. Um, that's kind of shifted some as Google has become everything to everybody. But there are, you know, you, and this is a really broad conversation, and, and um, I'll leave it to you to talk a little bit about the specifics of Arduino, but, um, you know, there's, there's also trade secret, copyright, trademark, ways you can protect your brand without tying up the technologies downstream. I, so I guess my view on that, is, you know, is, um, is shaped a little bit by history and a bunch of different technologies, right? So if you think you are at an early stage in the growth of a technology... Um, the, the history, especially of kind of network or platform technologies, has been that the companies who uh, uh, start out closed and proprietary uh, are often first movers, but they turn out not to be the ones who end up making the largest uh, impact, right? Apple uh, starts out uh, in the PC market. They've got leadership, uh, but because their system is not open uh, so that people can write different things to it, they end up a niche player in the market. Betamax starts out uh, in a leadership position in, in uh, video recorders, uh, but because their platform is not open, uh, uh, other people can, can move to it. I think we're seeing the same phenomenon again with Apple and smartphones, right, where they clearly start out in a leadership position, uh, but they're now something uh, globally less than 20% of the market. Uh, and part of the reason for that is you can't, at a very early stage, it's really hard to anticipate uh, all of the things that people might want to do uh, with your product, uh, all of the different ways they might move. Uh, and the best response, I think, from a business perspective to that is to, is to embrace a bunch of different possibilities. And the more willing you are to do that, um, the more likely you are that your platform will be, uh, will, will succeed, will be dominant. Now, from a private business perspective, I think the question's a little more complex than that because the fact that your platform succeeds doesn't necessarily mean that you are going to succeed, right? The VHS platform beats the beta platform, uh, but it doesn't follow that, uh, that the particular individual manufacturer of the first VHS, JVC, uh, turns out to have a dominant position there. Right, so there's a, uh, there's a, a kind of tension. You don't want to be the person who, lost in the mists of, mists of obscurity, is the one who came up with the platform that everyone now uses but no one buys from you. So part of the idea, I think, of the branding strategy right, is to try uh, to build into people's minds uh, the association between this platform and my products and my services, even though uh, because the platform's open, anybody's free to... to Act. So, you know, different people have different business models and different approaches, but my sense of kind of looking at networked technologies, if you're at a very early stage, uh, is that the open platforms are going to end up being the ones that grow faster than the closed ones. Uh, so, for robotics, you know, I think the question is, in any given niche, do you think you're at an, at an early stage, right? For, for some kinds of uh, of uh, manufacturing robotics, the answer may be no. The answer may be, you know what, I've got a particular market that I'm interested in, uh, right? I want to do robotic surgical arms, uh, and that's all I'm ever going to do, uh, and I'm better off kind of being the only person who can sell robotic surgical arms that implement this particular feature. Uh, if what I think I want is personal household robots that will do something for people in the future, but I'm not entirely sure exactly what, uh, then open this sounds like a much better deal to me. And also, from a technological standpoint, um, from a technological standpoint, you're looking at, at it, a lot of it, again, has to do with what, what the specific technological problem, the specific technological solution are. As has been true for every aspect of computer science technology up until now, robots aren't really going to blow us away until they're cooperating with each other and doing things together, right? And that's then when... they might literally blow us away. Then they might actually <laughs> blow us away, but... Um, but that's when it's that's that's going to be the game changer, right? When when they start to work, to, when you when you have teams of robots working together, 
And, um, and we have some of that now. There is some of that in automated warehouses and so on. But it's just starting. Well, but now you're getting at like the, really the crux of a lot of these problems, which is a lot of the platform questions that Mark is talking about, which is what if it's not just about your product? What if it's about your product's ability to work with other products? And now you, have, now you really face the question of, okay, am I going to try to build all the pieces of the giant ecosystem myself? Understanding that if I do, I will probably end up with a smaller ecosystem. If you're Apple, perhaps a smaller, phenomenally profitable ecosystem, but a smaller ecosystem nonetheless. Um, or do I, or am I, should I focus more on trying to create the ecosystem that lets others participate, knowing that if the ecosystem is huge, even my proportionally smaller piece will, will still be plenty big. So uh, one of the things I want to ask sort of specific about robotics relative to what we've been talking about is, um, is it's, it seems to me like this is an industry that has um, a tremendous amount of risk um, a lot of, of investment up front um, and, and, you know, a lot of upside potential, but, but a lot of potential f for failure uh, as well. Um, and I, obviously, it, it, robotics is a, is a huge, broad field that touches in a lot of areas, and, and there's going to be a spectrum of that. But um, it, it, assuming, I guess, that, that it is a, a high-risk, um, you know, high-expenditure um, area, is it one that we would view as you know, really needing the patent system in order to sort of move it forward. So I think, you know, it might make sense to talk a little bit historically about where the patent system works best and where it doesn't. Um, and what we've seen, you know, to the extent we're talking about the software and not the hardware, what we've seen with the software is that the patent system is not working. Um, and again, it depends what happens in the courts and it depends what happens in Congress and as Mark said, that's in flux over the next couple of years in particular, so that could change. But what we've seen, particularly in the world of software, which is totally relevant to robotics, is that there is um, a world of patents out there that are essentially impossible to understand, um, that you can't possibly scale, know what's in them all, and they're, they're used offensively to extract licenses or you know, to actually, in some instances, fully shut down products, to shut down competition. So that's really dangerous, and I, I think anything that this community can do to avoid that will be helpful, because what we've seen in, in the larger software uh, arena is that it's, um, if you're, you've got a business and you start making money, that's when you start hearing from these patent holders. Uh, and, and I don't know that you know, the robotics industry is going to be able to avoid that, because those patents are out there, and, and people are going to claim that they read on the software. I think the hardware is, is a more nuanced question, um, because the, the patents kind of surrounding the world of hardware haven't been as harmful. Though some people might disagree with me on that. Um, and Mark, you might be able to speak to the hardware a little bit more than, than I can. But um, to the extent the question is whether or not you need patents right now, for better or for worse, the world we live in makes it really hard for me to say to you, just ignore patents. Because they won't ignore you. They won't ignore you. No matter, I wish I could tell you that. I wish I could tell people that all the time. Unless we see some serious changes from you know, people in DC, that's just not going to happen. So uh, we can talk about ways to kind of navigate the system better or things that the community can do to actually make the system better, which is you know, what I would like to see, but <laughs> I also work for EFF, so obviously I would like to see that. Um, and I think that that's a separate, though that's a slightly separate topic. So, so the way Brian phrased the, the um, question in his uh, email to us was, is this an industry that needs the incentives provided by strong patent protection, or is broad patenting likely to hinder growth? Uh, and I think the answer is yes. Um, I, so on the one hand, right, one of the things that enables you to distinguish yourself as a startup is some sort of a proprietary technical position. Right? And if you go talk to your venture capitalists, uh, they want you to file patents. Uh, it's one of the things they use in assessing kind of where you are in your, in your corporate strategy. Uh, they, want it, they want it, I think, you know, maybe in part for signaling reasons, maybe in part because I think that it gives them comfort that what I've got here is a company that's at least somewhat distinguished in the marketplace from everybody else, right? That there's, that there's something out there conceptually that prevents somebody from just uh, doing exactly what you were doing and taking your market share away from you. Um, 
That said, I think there is a real risk uh, as uh, lots of companies start to, to file patents early that particularly if we give them broad patent protection, uh, we end up in a, in a thicket situation. I think we've seen that in smartphones, we've seen it in a bunch of software sectors, uh, we've seen it, I think, in, in, uh, in non-computer areas like uh, nanotechnology, uh, right, where if we patent all the basic building blocks, um, then it turns out to be really hard for anybody to build on that later. Uh, so, you know, I think it's, I, you know, one of the sort of oddities of the patent system is um, the patent system really does kind of work as a driver for startups, uh, but it works best when you never actually end up enforcing those patent rights, right? If I can, if I can get patent rights and there's a little bit of kind of separation in my, uh, in my technology space uh, uh, from my other uh, companies as a result, uh, may, then the system is working all right. Uh, if I end up kind of suing people and saying, you know what, I'm the only one who can do uh, some basic f uh, fee, some basic uh, thing in the industry, uh, then I think we're, we've got a more worrisome situation. And I guess I would say, just to note two other things to think about in the intellectual property regime. So Julie notes trade secret protection earlier. I think for some kinds of inventions in robotics, uh, trade secret's quite a viable alternative. Uh, if, if what I'm using is robotic technology inside my factory, um, uh, then I've got a, I'm probably better off with trade secret than patent protection, frankly, uh, because I've got a decent chance that I can keep that information from leaking out, uh, and it's both cheaper and easier to get. Um, maybe even if I've got a commercially released product, I can keep it uh, a secret if I can sort of keep the inner workings of the robot locked up. Uh, that's a little bit dicier as a proposition. It depends on how comfortable you think you are uh, taking the risk that somebody's going to be able to reverse engineer it. Uh, and then the other piece to note here is copyright, uh, especially if you've got a software-based model. Uh, the one thing you can pretty easily do without any patent protection at all is prevent people from copying your software. Uh, if, I, if my concern is counterfeiting, is knockoff, uh, uh, copyright is a, is a fairly cheap and I think reasonably effective means of going after that. Uh, it doesn't give you all of the rights that patent law does. In particular, it doesn't give you the right to go after independent inventors who came up with similar ideas on their own. Uh, but maybe that's not a bad thing. I would just really quickly, I'm sorry, let me okay. just really quickly build on something that Mark said. When you talked about um, venture capitalists who want to see patents um, before they invest, I will just say that, that we're seeing a trend going the other way too. Um, I know a lot of people in the VC world who, and it's just, it's a growing trend, it's still small, but you know, who, who are turned off by what's been happening with patents um, and, and how they've been used as kind of tools in many instances for extortion instead of innovation. So I, I think I would just say that there, if you guys are doing work as a company or with a company who really doesn't want to have to play this game, there are alternate ways to do it. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there. It's not all terrible. Yeah, I just wanted to say, t talking very briefly about this hardware-software distinction, the hardware-software distinction, is, it's actually, it's a proxy for the real distinction, which is um, relatively easy to research and develop versus relatively hard, where the relatively easy comparatively is software and the relatively hard comparatively is hardware, but that's not always true. And for, for either case, not all hardware is hard to develop and not all software is easy to develop. Um, and from, so from, from a public policy standpoint, you know, the ideal that you're trying to achieve is the one in which you have patent protection such that the innovation that would otherwise not have happened because it would be too hard to develop and there would be not enough gold at the end of the rainbow when you did it would not happen. It would get dropped on the floor because people said, boy, without patent protection, I'll do this and then I'll just get picked up by this bigger competitor who's just going to be able to add it as a feature and so I won't bother. Um, versus the situation where you very inexpensively develop a technology and patent it and you would have done it anyway. You would have done it just for the right to be first to the market. You would have done it just for the right to get your brand in line, as you talked about the Arduino example. There's, a, you know, there's another world where people are just sprinting, and that world is super productive from a, from a societal progress standpoint. 
but, without, but some guys don't play that game because they, they can't run fast enough even if they have great ideas. And so that, the line is actually, you know, you can actually have software that takes a tremendous amount of time to develop. Um, and you can have hardware that's in hardware innovation that you just you banged out in a, in a long afternoon with a good lab. And um, so, so really the question is, what sorts of innovations deserve protection and what sorts don't? Um, it's hardware and software is, it's, 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 it's not a terrible proxy for it, but it's, it's hardly a perfect proxy for that distinction. What's unfortunate to me about the larger debate on intellectual property law lately is that it's kind of become unmoored from that question, and this is a little bit more atmospheric, but I think it's an important thing to think about, um, particularly when you talk about patents and to some extent copyright, which is, our, of course, in the Constitution, in Article One, Section 8, and, you know, the Congress has the power to grant these things for the progress of useful arts and sciences, you know, so that we actually come up with innovation in this country. So the question to my mind is, well, what's actually going to incentivize the innovation that's going to make the world a better place, that's going to kind of give these technologies to our society that are great and exciting? Um, and, and I wish we had this conversation more. I wish what you just said, Christian, was something we talked about more so we can think not just what's going to make a company a bunch of money, which is all well and good, and you know I'm not opposed to people making a bunch of money, but I, I don't want that to get in the way of getting exciting technologies out there. That um, and, and that is the tension that you know I wish we all always talked about because I think we'd be in a better place. But I want to just follow up on, on something Mark uh, said a moment ago about you know it. it the ideal is sort of, you know, uh, people people get patents um, but don't necessarily enforce them. Um, and, and I think, right, the, the obvious problem is that assets get sold. Um, and, and so I, I'm wondering, you know, are, are we, in, in the robotics industry, uh, is, is it sort of doomed uh, to repeat uh, the, you know, uh, patenting uh, issues with, uh, it, you know, internet patents and software patents. Um, maybe the answer will come from the federal circuit um, in, in the CLS uh, case. I, I am skeptical um, about that. But you know, so are there? You know, are we doomed to sort of repeat that, or are there things? And some of them are things that have already come up about you know industry alliances. Um, that could possibly change some of that, but you know, are there specific things? Is there legislation that should be considered, uh, or other things that that we can take lessons from from the past and sort of apply immediately? Yeah. So uh, you know, the the problem of patent trolls, right, which is now uh, an enormous issue in, in the patent system as a whole. Sixty percent of all lawsuits filed last year were were patent troll lawsuits, uh, and and in the software industry, it's more like eighty five percent. Um, the problem, I think, comes, uh, as Brian suggests, right, out of a bunch of people who got patents, not intending to go out and sue people and make money, right, but to protect themselves against others in the industry or to impress their venture capitalists or whatever else. Um, and, and that works as long as your business is growing uh, and thriving. Uh, but once the business is no longer growing, either you don't make it in the marketplace or even if you kind of once made it in the marketplace, you're no longer competitive, uh, your revenues are declining. Well, these assets are sitting there and they're not doing any work for you. And gosh, look at all these other people over there who are making a lot of money uh, with their patents by licensing them or suing on them. And so the tendency is very strong uh, either to go out and sue people yourself or to spin the patents out to people who will go out and sue them or, you know, in the uh, ultimate extreme case, right, you go into bankruptcy and people buy up the assets and they, and they sue them. And but the ultimate extreme case is common. Just oh, to be yeah, clear, yeah, yeah. the ultimate right, right, case yes, is right. rare. That's not a, I, yes, <laughs> from, from a your business perspective, that's not presumably how you would like to monetize your asset. Uh, uh, so, so the question is what to do about it. I mean, one possible thing we could do about it is we could sort of change the law around patent trolls, and uh, maybe I'll let Julie talk a little bit about that. Um, I just want to flag one other very interesting model, uh, which is in some sense a kind of uh, a variant of the open source model. We've seen folks in the internet software business adopt uh, preemptive commitments not to assert their patents against others except defensively. So 
So Twitter has an uh, innovator's patent assignment that basically says, uh, Twitter employees, give us your inventions, we will patent them, but we promise that we will only uh, use those patents to sue people who are already suing us to basically defend ourselves, and we're willing to put our money where our mouth is, and we will give you, the individual inventor, the right to grant a license to anybody uh, in circumstances where you think we've breached that deal. Uh, so it's not just we promise, but we might change our minds later. Uh, we'll let somebody else do it. Now, what's notable about that, I think, is it's, uh, it's a real indication of a worry about uh, uh, these kind of patents being loosed upon the world uh, that, you know, uh, a bunch of patent lawyers looked at that and they said, oh, my God, Twitter's nuts. I don't know what they're doing. They're giving away this asset and look at all the money they could have later. Uh, but I think what the engineers said is on, in Twitter, cool. Uh, right, and maybe now we'll actually sort of disclose our inventions. And a bunch of engineers, in thinking about where they wanted to go to work, said, "Yeah, I don't want my ideas being turned into patent trolls ten years down the line, and this is a desirable thing for me." And, and really quickly, on the Twitter IPA, as they call it, something that's really important that Mark already kind of said, but just to be clear, the way Twitter's, Twitter has crafted this license is that this promise goes with the patent. So if Twitter sells it one day that inventor still can stop, you know, company ABC who bought it from using the patent offensively. And that's something that, you know, that, that was a theme of everything Mark just said, but is really important because what the data show is that most of the patents that are used offensively by patent trolls are used offensively in the last three to four years out of their 20-year life. You know, so, okay, I've got this patent. It's 15 years old. I'm not using that technology anymore. I'm going to sell it for whatever it's worth because, you know, it's worth more than the piece of paper it's printed on, presumably. And that's when these patents get used um, offensively by unscrupulous actors, shall we say, um, <laughs> trolls, perhaps. Um, and, and so because of that, that's, that's a lot of the problem. So some of the um, potential reforms out there that are interesting are ideas about making patents, uh, and this one doesn't have that political legs yet, but I think it could one day, making patents more expensive to keep up so that maybe um, they don't have the kind of dangerously long shelf life. What we've seen is that 20 years is, is too long for software. The technology is moving so quickly that, you know, five years, what you needed to cover, um, you know, you don't need to cover anymore. So these patents just kind of sit collecting dust, and that's how they end up in these dangerous hands. And then litigation is so expensive. The threat of litigation, the threat of patent litigation, you're talking something like 2 to $5 million per well, not for a troll side, but a defense side, if you've got one patent in question, two to three years, if you're lucky, of your life in federal court. And why would you do that if you could just settle? And, and let, me, let me just sort of, that, that raises one important point. So Julie says maybe five years is too long. So one important thing to realize in thinking about your business strategy around patents is it takes uh, now on average between three and four years for the patent office to issue a patent. So if you come up with an idea, you're then going to get a little while for your lawyer to write the thing, and then it's going to go sit in the patent office for three or four years. In the software and internet, internet worlds, what that means is by the time a patent even comes out and is in force, it is obsolete. Right? It's almost by definition either useful only against old technology uh, or what we've seen is people try to stretch the meaning of this idea that I had 8, 10, 15 years ago to cover what the world's actually doing now even though it looks rather different. So one thing to think about from a robotics perspective is what do I think the product life cycle in my industry is? Uh, is this something that I think is going to be around for a while, and that may be more true on the hardware side? Uh, right? Are we going to have a kind of, are the basic principles that I'm building right now going to still be in uh, devices I'm building 10 years from now? Uh, or is this a fast-moving industry? Are we, are we imagining sort of software uh, apps for robots, uh, which five years from now may be a completely different uh, set of things are being used, in which case how much protection I'm going to get for my invention from the patent system seems to me problematic at the outset. Yeah, this, this might be um, a goofy question, but so, so is, is, there such a, is there a possibility that in robotics where you have things like the ROS, like the robot operating system, you have um, uh, the, uh, some common technologies because folks like Willa Barrage and Microsoft and others have come up with common technologies for people to build upon because robotics is so difficult, right? I mean, could you not build into that system? If you're going to use our common platform, hardware or software, you may not.
not engage in the kind of shenanigans that you, you don't know what it is. Is that a possibility? Yeah, sure. But I mean, the question is just what are those shenanigans? Like, it, it, is, it is actually tricky to define the shenanigan. Right, because it is right, because because the, the guy who's who's got the idea again, again the line needs to be drawn where the, it works best, the system works properly when the line is drawn in such a way that the inventor who otherwise would not bring his invention to the light of day because he cannot leverage it commercially effectively does so because he can protect it, but not when the inventor who would have brought it to market anyway does so and reaps outsized rewards. And, and that's, you know, you, you could build such a, you could probably build a system that would force participants to surrender intellectual property rights, and you would get some participants, and you would not get some, and some of the ones who would not participate, their, their ideas would fall on the floor. Well, and this is... Would you shorten the term? Oh, sorry. Well, go ahead. Couldn't you just say as a condition of using this operating system, the term for packets is shortened, so we can have to be... Yeah, that's interesting. I, so, so... Um, the, our experience with open source software, right, which seems to me the closest analogy, right? open source software is an effort basically to say, you can use my code, but in turn you've got to agree to bind yourself in various ways, uh, not to go out and sue other people, uh, to release your code in turn. Um, that's actually worked, I think, within the open source community quite well in copyright law. It's run into more significant problems in patent law because patent law doesn't require any copying. It doesn't actually have to have a chain. And most, I mean, almost all of the software patent lawsuits that are filed today are not filed by people who say, you got this idea from me, you copied it from me. Uh, they're filed by uh, people against independent yeah. inventors. The, ca the carrot is the use. Right. In, in the open source software, the carrot is you get to use this. But in in patent law, the patent holder does not necessarily have to want to play in the right. system in order to have rights. So, that, so, there, so there are two, then, two limitations on this approach. One is you're never going to get the people who are outside the ROS system uh, anyway, right? That is, you can't make anyone give up their rights if they're not playing in that system. And then the question becomes, how valuable is it to me to play in that system? Uh, and am I willing to give up some set of rights in order to do it? And the answer may be yes, right? So I think it's not a crazy idea to try to say, uh, you know what, we've got something really valuable here uh, that everybody's going to want to participate in, but for it to work, we need to put some limits on people's ability to, to hold up the process later on, so you agree to these contractual restrictions uh, by using the, uh, the ROS. Whether that works, I think, is a function of uh, how many people find the ROS so important that they really have to adopt it, even if they might otherwise have filed a lawsuit. So I actually i am cautiously optimistic about that. And we've been doing some work in this space. And you know, what Mark's getting at is there's a threshold problem that exists more so than it does in the copyright software space, which is you have to have a threshold of patent rights so that everyone has to want it. Um, because there are going to be these threats from the outside that you can't get rid of in the patent space. Now, if you have a tight-knit enough group who's committed to making this work with a threshold amount of patent rights, I think, then you can also face those outside threats because you can use economies of scale to face those outside threats. It's still tougher than the traditional open source model, but I don't think it's impossible. One, one thing you could see is, I, I could also see that in particular um, on, the, on the fee side, for, for situations like that. You can imagine people saying, if you buy into our system, for example, any patents you have have to be licensed and, and have to be brand licensed. And that would be, you know, that would already be, um, I think, a way to say, like, you know, you, you can't just stop somebody from using it. If you buy into our system, you agree that other people can use your ideas as long as they pay some reasonable royalty. Like, that would already, I think, probably take the, take the, the sharp edge off. And this idea is floating around already in a paper called The Defense of Patent License by uh, Jason Schultz and Jennifer Urban from Berkeley. Um, and I recommend you all take a read of that. Um, it's, it's a similar idea where it's kind of like everyone contributes and, you know, what we're talking about. Um, so I think that we've been doing a lot of work in this space. And, and this is what's exciting about robotics to me and, and also why I talked about 3D printing earlier is because you have to work with a community of similar interests for this to work. You can't just throw it open and say every software patent or every hardware patent ever. It's just um, yeah. not I mean, realistic. I mean, I'll be, with, with robotics, because it's really just emerging, let me very briefly throw out a couple of 
of counterexamples that suggest that you need to be a little, a little bit careful about condemning the large company that comes in and, and does a lot of work and protects it. You know, without the IP rights that they, that, they, that they were able to leverage, you might not have had the iPhone. And you might not have the entire smartphone business that we have now. You might not have all of the productivity that we have now. You might have had it eventually. You might have had it four or five years later. Maybe you would have had it at the same time. It's hard to know. But what we do know is that Apple was able to come in and make an enormous amount of money in part because they could really protect what they had. And so sometimes it's hard to pick out when, um, it's when the benefit of a large company being able to come in and say, I'm going to spend X billion dollars creating something here in no small part because I can protect it and make $100 billion afterwards. And sometimes that's actually a good thing. Or it may be. It's hard to know because the alternate universe never takes place. So, um, oh, I'm sorry. Questions? Uh, one idea that I've heard uh, kind of discussed a little bit was the uh, concept of some major players in an emerging field like this getting together to purchase some of the fundamental patents covering you know, uh, basic areas and then making those available to a group or, or open source um, to address whether anything like that is. Uh, so I don't know whether it's happening in the robotics field. I, so people kind of uh, bandy ideas around like this in the kind of software and, and IT worlds on a regular basis. And some people have even done it. Uh, although I think there are kind of two limitations. One is antitrust law. Uh, so to the extent it's all the big players in the field get together and pool their resources. It makes people nervous. Uh, it makes, yeah, it makes antitrust lawyers very nervous and with good reason. Um, and, and to be fair, right, I mean, we don't want, just as we don't want one patent owner to be able to kind of hold up an industry and shut stuff down, we also don't want, you know, a group of entrenched players to be able to say to any new entrant, ah, you've got to give us your, your patent licenses on really cheap terms because we, we're big and we can demand that. Um, and then the second worry is, um, is I think you never, you're never going to get all the patents. Uh, and so the question then becomes, what do I get? Well, I might get enough rights that I can uh, uh, sort of feel comfortable uh, that if a practicing company sues me uh, for practicing this, uh, let's say, an open source operating system invention, there are now a pool of patents that we can use to sue back. And so I might be able to engage in a cross-license transaction or deter that lawsuit. I'm never going to be able to use that threat to deter the patent trolls, though, because if they're not in the market, they don't really care how many patents you've got. All they care is that they've got a patent uh, and you owe them some money for it. What's, I mean, another area that we've seen some movement on um, is, is, people, is organization, you know, companies working together actually substantively to, to make progress within the existing system. If, for example, collaborating on prior art so they can actually invalidate patents. Um, working preemptively by trying to get patents re-examined that they are aware of, that they believe are a threat, even though they don't think they should have been granted. And there's actually a place where parties can collaborate, and it's very straightforward. You know, a lot of these complex issues aren't there. They just say, you know, company A did a ton of research in robotics. Company B does a ton of research in robotics. Okay, if they are willing to pool their knowledge for the purposes of establishing that somebody else didn't come up with something first, that's, from their perspective, just a win-win. I mean, th that's something that they can do that you know, they have, there's, there are issues they have to deal with. They have to deal with whether or not they're willing to give up their secrets and, and which of their stuff is trade secret protected and then do they share it and when do they agree to disclose it. I mean, th none of these are easy issues and that's why lawyers get paid a lot of money. Um, not me, but other but actual lawyers. I'm not actually a lawyer, so I just get to watch. So, um, but you know, the thing is that that actually is a, it's a relatively straightforward bargain and, it's, and it, in many ways it, it accomplishes what, what the companies who are paying to do R&D because they want to put out a product to want to do, which is that they want to kind of bring the currency of patents down collectively in a way that also brings the currency down on, on um, non-practicing entities. And I mean, but the, the truth of the matter is though, I think we, the, the biggest obstacle to this is not that it doesn't work or it can't be done, it's that when the, when the chips are down, companies oftentimes don't want to do it. They, they have a bunch of patents and their engineers are telling them that those patents are really important and they don't necessarily want to bring the currency down. 
And what we see a lot, actually, with regard to that, that's an int it's interesting from a sociology perspective, if nothing else, is you have a small company. People don't want to waste time or money patenting. They don't care about it. They do it sometimes because they feel like they have to, to get investment or whatever. But as the company grows and you bring in you know, a general counsel and maybe you bring in a patent lawyer and you start getting bigger and bigger and you bring in people who don't have that connection to the technology in that very kind of like pure way from the early days, that's when you start seeing uh, tensions within the companies to get the patent. So I think there's a lot of questions out there, and this is something I think a lot about too, is how a company can retain its culture if it starts off with a culture of openness, how it can retain that culture when it starts bringing in these more traditional, you know, I don't want to say business interests, but maybe corporate interests. I'm not really sure the right terminology. Um, and I think that's something that, that emerging technologies like robotics need to pay a lot of attention to. Um, it's interesting you say that, Julie, because um, we, we do a CLE on analyzing high-tech patent portfolios, and we did, a, we did a really good hard look at the AOL portfolio when Microsoft and Facebook bought it. And one of the things that we do is we have this, this chart that shows the, the patent applications by year stacked that shows them the different areas. And there's an enormous spike when AOL and Time Warner merge. <laughs> Right, which is, I mean, I'm, we're speculating, but influx of cash and influx of a, of a more rigid corporate culture that says we, you need to secure what you've got. And, and then there's a big drop off around the time when they split apart again. Um, not that there was nothing before. AOL was filing a lot of applications before and then they, they kept filing some after, but there's this big, you know, big mountain in the graph, which coincides with exactly what Julie's talking about, which is, you know, guys who are not coming at it from the tech community side, but coming at it from the, well, quite frankly, from the shareholder interest side. What's best for our shareholders? Let me take just one more question, then I want to switch topics a little bit here. So, yeah. um, oh, go ahead. Um, so, so there's been a lot of interesting discussion on the panel so far. Um, it's Uh, why are you both looking at me? <laughs> uh, right, the question is, the question is not how does IP shape robotics, but how might robotics shape IP? I, so I guess, you know, thinking uh, a little more broadly and, and not just about robotics, but about some of the other technologies. So Julie mentioned 3D printing. Um, in another area, we've got synthetic biology, right? All of which, at least depending on your model of robotics, right, seem to me to offer the prospect of separating um, uh, manufacturing and behavior uh, from design, uh, both in a kind of uh, a temporal and in a place sense, right? So if the answer is, um, I can cause uh, actions to occur in the real world, um, by writing my design uh, spec uh, specification and software and posting it on the internet. Uh, and then you at home with your 3D printer or in your uh, synthetic biology lab with your uh, assembler uh, or uh, in your, this is the open uh, robotics model, right? In your house or your factory with a robot, right? That's now got a capability to generate something, to do something it never did before. I think that's a tremendous uh, uh, issue for intellectual property, right? Because it's what we've basically done is we've taken a bunch of things that looked like traditional manufacturing uh, markets or maybe service markets, uh, and we've made them look like the internet, right? Where you've got uh, some players who provide platforms, uh, and you've got an endless array of people uh, who provide an endless array of ideas, which can actually be operationalized on those platforms. Uh, and what we've seen in the internet is uh, a couple of things, right? One is it actually it puts enormous pressure on the traditional IP models, right? A, a business regime that says I and only I sell this, I and only I provide uh, uh, information uh, for your platforms uh, tends to fail. 
And I think especially if we end up with general purpose robots, we're going we're to see that as well, right? The idea that, uh, oh, you've got a robot that's a multifunction, but the only people who are going to provide software uh, for that robot are the people who sold you the robot. That's not a business model that's got legs in the long run, right? That's, a, that's something that's going to get driven out by the, you know what, I'm going to get my apps from wherever I want to get my apps. Um, uh, and... It, and and you are not the only one who can write them. Um, so I think it leads, it, it drives us away from, uh, in legal terms, from uh, a direct liability question, right? Are you infringing my IP right to secondary liability? Because often the guy who's out there infringing your IP right is somewhere, you don't know who he is, he might be 16 years old uh, in Kazakhstan, and what he's really done is posted on the internet. Uh, so people look for these choke points to try to shut down access to uh, uh, the information that they think is problematic from an IP perspective. And I, let me just note there that it's not just an IP issue, right? Once I've got a robot in my home that can be reprogrammed uh, at will by downloading software over the internet, there are a lot of things that robot might do that we are going to be troubled by socially, or some subset of people are going to be troubled by socially, right? So just as on the internet, uh, right, we fight about a bunch of things that the internet allows us to do good and bad, I think the separation of the device and the content that operates that device is going to be really important. I think that's right. And I, I think, too, that when we talk about frankly, any emerging technology, but particularly this one that's got, you know, so much wide-ranging potential. We talk about a lot of reform and a lot of things that can go better, that we can take lessons from what's gone wrong in the past. Um, part of the disaster we've seen around these kind of software internet patents that we've been talking a lot about, and I, I think is really instructive uh, to the world of robotics, is that uh, there was this rush, and it's still frankly, going on at the patent office to get as many patents as possible, as quickly as possible. The technology is new. The examiners aren't always familiar with it. Things get pushed through quickly, and you end up in a world with, frankly, a lot of patents of, um, you know, crappy quality. Um, and so to the extent that the community surrounding robotics can push itself away from that and, and not make it a world where all these companies feel like they just need to grow their patent portfolios for defensive purposes, um, I think you know, the world will be better off. And, and I think that that's, you know, there are ways to talk about organizing around that and messaging around that, um, but it's totally doable. I think that the, um, that line I was talking about earlier about difficult to develop versus easy to develop, that line is going to be the thorniest ever with robotics because it's going to be a completely seamless integration of of software, which as a general rule can be developed fast, and arbitrary interaction with the physical world, which is potentially arbitrarily hard. And, you know, I, there seems to be relative, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a consensus in the middle, I, there are people disagree on either side, but there's a consensus in the middle that, that really difficult to develop things that you really want to incent people to develop, they should have some protection for. And that things that people develop really easily that they were gonna do anyway, they shouldn't. And that line is going to be harder than ever to, to establish. Um, the so hardware software proxy just won't work, for example, in robotics. And, and I think that w the one way in which robotics might change IP is that you might actually see that core question get grappled with in a new way, that people may try to think about in a new way, how are we actually going to, to try to draw lines that capture, um, that capture this distinction between that which is difficult and which needed to be incented and that which was not so difficult and did not need to be incented. But there are ways you can incentivize things without granting patents, too. Sure. Of course. Which one? Uh, so let, let me just <clears throat> switch topics a little bit and stay with you, Christian. Um, I, I want to talk about your paper. Um, so can you give us all just a sort of a, a, a little summary about what the, th the thrust of the paper is and, and see if we can build on that? Sure. The, the paper is about a case that, and in full disclosure, I was actually retained as an expert by Storage Tech in the case, but it's a, it's a case on a robotic system. It's a very old robotic system, which is the Storage Tech tape silo system, which is a, a robotic arm that swings around and grabs tapes out of shelves and sticks them into tape drives. And uh, that sounds incredibly archaic. Google recently bought a bunch of new ones, so it's not that, it's not like it's, not like it's gone yet. Um, and that, and, um, Storage Tech had proprietary diagnostics in the silo systems, and there was a, and they made a lot of money off of the maintenance of the devices because the devices were incredibly well built if they were properly maintained. 
It lasted forever, so a lot of the money was in the maintenance and servicing of the devices. Um, these silos are really big. They're like 10 feet tall and 12 feet in diameter. And um, there was a third-party maintenance provider, and they were um, unlocking storage text diagnostics and using them to provide maintenance to customers. And so there was a big lawsuit between the, between the parties, and one of the claims was a digital millennium copyright claim that, that this unlocking of storage text diagnostics violated Section 1201 provisions of the DMCA, which, which, prevent, um, which prohibit um, circumventing a technological measure that prevents access to a copyrighted work. And um, the Federal Circuit ultimately said to Storage Tech, no, because what the third party maintenance provider was doing was not actually resulting in a new copyright violation, either by them or by anyone else. Um, new, new actionable copies weren't being created by the unlocking that they were doing. But at the same time, they, they sort of drew a, plotted a course by which Storage Tech could have gotten around that problem if they had simply engineered their system such that circumventing that mechanism created a copy in RAM. That if a new copy had been created in RAM, that argument would have failed. Um, it, just, it really just boiled down to exactly the, how that particular bit of software was engineered. And in a separate case, in MDYV Blizzard in the Ninth Circuit, the Ninth Circuit said, yeah, we read what the Federal Circuit had to say, but we just disagree. We think Congress created a new right within the Digital Millennium Copyright Act for manufacturers actually to prevent people from accessing copyrighted works even outside the context of a copy. So all of which is to say, either by following kind of the roadmap that the Federal Circuit created or by just saying the Ninth Circuit says we're good in either case, there's a pretty clear way here for manufacturers to use the Digital Millennium Copyright Act to prevent people from accessing the software um, within their devices and that becomes particularly important again if you talk about the interoperability scenario. If you're talking about robots talking to robots and working together and you have a situation in which so somebody wants to buy robot one for manufacturer A and robot two for manufacturer B. Can the manufacturers actually can manufacturer A, you know, A actually stop manufacturer B from interoperating with them by using the DMCA, the anti-circumvention provisions of the DMCA, to keep people from accessing the software? That's the thumbnail sketch. So, I mean, I think to me, my reaction in, in reading the paper was that it, it's it's pretty likely that that people are going to going to do this, right? I mean, it seems, um, you know, in the same vein that, that um, you're going to have uh, a lot of people seeking um, broad uh, patent protection. I think it's another avenue for people to, to protect their, their investment. Um, so, I mean, you, you know, I guess the question I have is um, what is there that should result from that, right? I mean, um, you know, well, the what should the industry? The for starters, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, right. But um, you know, you know, how should the industry deal with that issue? Um, and you know, is there legislation or something else that needs to, to take place um, in order to, to deal with this issue? One quick point, and then I'll turn it over to the lawyers. Interestingly, one additional protection that manufacturers get if they leverage the anti-circumvention provisions of the DMCA is that they make it harder for people to access, by making it harder for people to access their code, they make it harder for people to analyze their products for purposes of infringement. And I understand this concern very deeply because I'm one of the guys that the manufacturers come to and they ask me, how does this thing work? And we say, well, we're going to have to do this in order to find out. And please sign this part of our engagement agreement where I bet you in, in which you indemnify us against all, everything that happens, right? Because, you know, they're, they're actually, it allows people to create legal risks. So, legal risk against analyzing for infringement. So you now have probably two different phenomena that Julie hates fighting each other. <laughs> so. I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit too about what's going on politically with regard to, to Brian's question. I think it's really relevant. Number one, I don't know if you've all been following um, the cell phone unlocking debate, whether or not you can unlock your cell phones. There's some legislation. So you, you can't unlock your cell phones, arguably. Um, and it, it's really relevant to this question of Section 1201 under the DMCA, what you can or can't do with hardware you bought that has software on it. Um, Congress is trying to deal with that right now in, in two distinct ways. One, there are some um, smaller, more discrete bills floating around uh, about just unlocking, just the unlocking phenomenon, pretty much. Um, the other thing that's really interesting that's probably more like a decade-long fight is that the Register of Copyrights, Maria Palentia, recently came to the House of Representatives and said, it's time for a new Copyright Act, essentially. You know, the last one we have is from 1976. It was written in the 1960s. It 
doesn't make any sense for the kind of technology we use and how we use it. So we're in the really early stages of a much larger conversation about what the Copyright Act should and shouldn't do. Um, people I work with feel very strongly that this is a good time to address a lot of these problems with Section 1201. Um, and I, I'm cautiously optimistic that we'll get some reform around there. Uh, we'll kind of see where that goes. Like I said, we're at the really early stages of this debate. But, you know, and, and I think I'd probably make, I've been doing it <laughs> implicitly this whole time, this morning, but, you know, I would make a plug to all of you who care about these kinds of issues to get involved, to stay involved, because um, we're seeing movement on the Hill. We're seeing that, that people Policymakers in Washington, D.C. in particular, care about what's wrong in copyright. They care about what's wrong in patents. I don't think that um, we can have that conversation without talking about what happened with SOPA and PIPA just, you know, a year and a half ago, um, where kind of all these Internet users, like 10 million people, sent letters and phone calls to Congress saying, this isn't working for us. So that matters. You know, involvement matters. And you can't just sit back and assume that a bunch of you know, old people sitting in the Capitol are going to get it right. You have to tell them what's going to work with regard to the technologies you use and how you use it. Because I guarantee you, there is not a single senator who understands robotics as well as anyone in this room. So I'm, uh, I, I, I think I agree with everything Julie said, except that I would describe myself as cautiously apocalyptic <laughs> about the idea of major copyright reform in this country. Uh, I, so it may well be that we get some. Um, the likelihood that, uh, notwithstanding the sort of internet outpouring around SOPA and PIPA, it makes copyright better rather than worse strikes me as vanishingly small. Uh, that uh, if and when there's major copyright reform, lots and lots of industries with lots and lots of money will show up and say, here are all of the bad things that people are doing to me on the internet and make them stop. Uh, and, uh, and Congress will figure out various ways to try to make them stop. Uh, now, how does this affect you in the robotics industry? You know, we don't know because we don't know how the sort of laws will play out, right? It will not be robotics that drives that conversation. Uh, I suspect, It'll be Steamboat Willie. Uh, yeah. It will be Steamboat Willie and, uh, and book publishers and, uh, uh, you know, Lord of the Rings and, you know, I mean, a wide variety of things that are sort of, you know, easily available uh, uh, unlawfully on the Internet. Um, I mean, I do think on the, on the specific uh, anti-circumvention issue, I do think there, there is a very direct robotics analogy, right? So take uh, what Julie said about uh, unlock your smartphone uh, and just substitute in robot. Roomba. Uh, right, the question, yeah, the question of can I unlock my Roomba, right, and have it do something else um, is, is one that is right now <laughs> governed by copyright law in ways that sort of nobody, I think, has thought about. I would just like to say that if I agree with Mark, I would not be able to get up every morning. <laughs> So, so it's, if, we, if we think that, um, you know, legislatively we're not maybe going to get the answer, does this just boil down to um, back or fall back to the same kind of question of, you know, what benefits the industry more open or closed, uh, you, you know, source? Um, what benefits the industry more um, greater, you know, patenting or more, you know, industry collaboration? Um, or, or are there other sort of issues on the, on the DMCA front, you know, that, that come into play here? Well, there are, you know, of course, like with anything, there are short-term and long-term answers to those questions. In the short term, you know, for people who are going back to where you're from and working on these things next week, next month, nothing will have changed. And you're unfortunately going to find yourself faced with a world where you're going to feel like you need to have patents, where you're going to feel like you need to protect yourself in ways that might have some negative effects one day for the larger industry. It's People are finding themselves between a rock and a hard place. There are a lot of people who are working really hard to fix that, and I'm optimistic that in the long term, it will be better. It will not be great. It will not be perfect, but it will be better. Um, so I would just kind of caution folks to think about that when you make your short-term decisions. For instance, if we talk about patents, Twitter's innovator patent assignment agreement that we talked about already. It's a really short document. It's less than two pages. It's publicly available. They, in fact, put it on GitHub so people could comment on it when they first released it. And I would say if you find yourself working at or for a company that feels the need to get software patents, I would recommend that you use Twitter's IPA. It's not proprietary. You know, there are things you can do in the short term that, that will limit the harm 
your uh, actions might have in the long term. So let me just say this about the DMCA, right? I mean, I, so, and this is, I think, in the broader lesson category. I was there 15 years ago when the DMCA was sort of uh, hashed out uh, as a sort of negotiated compromise because I'm really old. Um, and, um, and it was a compromise in which the copyright industries got this anti-circumvention protection. We can make it illegal for you to crack. Uh, uh, copy protection systems and we can make it illegal for you to sell devices or software that allows people to crack copy protection systems. And in return, what the uh, nascent internet industry got were a set of specific safe harbors uh, based on things like uh, uh, running a search engine or caching uh, that, that were pretty riddled with exceptions. And everyone in that negotiation on both sides thought that the copyright industry just ran the table. Uh, they got a really powerful anti-circumvention right that's going to change everything. Uh, they managed to riddle the safe harbor exception with loopholes. It isn't going to change anything. Um, internet industry lost this debate politically. That turned out to be exactly backwards. Um, I think because of the ways technologies and markets developed in ways that people couldn't anticipate. Both that copy protection turned out to be anathema to consumers, so that while you actually have a really powerful anti-circumvention anti right that protects copy protection, if you load copy protection in your product, no one will buy it. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, that the safe harbors both got interpreted a little more broadly than we feared they would, uh, but also ended up kind of sheltering and therefore generating these enormous explosion of innovation in companies like YouTube that would just not have been conceivable in the absence of a safe harbor. So the lesson to me for that is, is actually one, I think, uh, uh, for a nascent industry and legislation that it's really hard to know uh, how it is legislation is going to affect your, uh, uh, your life, right? And both because you don't know how the technology is going to change. They wrote the safe harbors in 1998. They do not say anything about peer-to-peer -peer file sharing because that wasn't developed until January of 1999. Uh, and Congress hadn't heard about it, right, until we saw a commercial adaptation of file sharing in Napster in 99. Um, so technology is going to change in ways that the law is not going to anticipate. Uh, and business models may change in part around that law in ways that are really hard to anticipate. So I don't I, think you yeah. can underscore that enough. Without the DMCA safe harbor provisions, YouTube could not exist, period, full stop. Yeah. But, but the other thing to note here, and this is, I think, where there's you know, certain reason to be very optimistic for robotics, I think, which is the, 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 I think there's, there's an undercurrent to what Mark is describing, which is that the products matter, and that although there's all this framework that's, you know, this legal framework that's, that, that has goals, and maybe it is accomplishing them, and maybe it isn't, and maybe it's creating obstacles, and maybe it isn't, but, but ultimately, the, the power of the products really matter. The product that you, can, that you can develop, that you can prove to the market, to the world, will change everything, has the ability to move the dial. It has the ability to move the dial and move the way the rules are perceived. Um, you know, if you read the f first couple of a couple of the big DMCA decisions, the the Lexmark decision and the Skylink v. Chamberlain decision, what the courts are and and in the Storage Tech decision, what the courts is really saying there is, we're just not going to let you use this to keep people from using third-party print cartridges, and we're just not going to let you use this to stop people from buying other garage door openers. Mm -hmm. And if you can, you know, if the product is is good enough. I'm not saying you, you can get you can get away, you know you can get away with murder or anything. And there are companies that got blown up pretty badly for having the product that was you know that provided a ton of social benefit, but ultimately was a foul of the law too hard in order to make it. But but you can really move the dial by having the product that sh that has proven it proves its social significance. Yeah, and I would say if the product is good enough, and if enough people can find out about it before it's sued to be shut down, right? Because <laughs> I, I think that's quite serious, right? So you know I, I think. If, if the, um, the, the content industry right now is suing to try to shut down the current generation DVR uh, in the Fox v. Dish Network case, in a, in a case I'm involved in, I think they're too late. 
right? I think it's quite possible that if they had said before anyone ever actually bought a TiVo, uh, oh God, this is a real threat to us and we're going to shut it down, the, co the courts might have been perfectly happy to say, oh yeah, that's a device that just allows you to copy stuff and, uh, and store it and you skip the commercials and, and you're hurting the business model of the content industry. So I, I think it's, I, I, Chris is absolutely right to say, right, if your technology is good enough and if people, if it's widely adopted enough that people can recognize its benefits, um, I, I think of this as the law clerk model, right? If the, if the, judge's law, the judge isn't going to be using the technology, uh, but if the judge's law clerks are using the technology, right, then you've got, you got a decent shot. Um, the judge has a TiVo. Right? Uh, well, so it may be, right? And not, not, yeah, not our judge. Uh, our judge does not have a DVR. Um, uh, so, so I think that's right. And, and the other thing I, worth noting is IP is going to kind of move the needle on business models in some directions. It's going to say, go this route, not go that route. It's going to raise or lower the costs of engaging in those business models. But I think, except at the very extremes, it's not going to sort of say that a really lucrative technological opportunity will just go away entirely. Uh, right? I, you know, I think IP makes software innovation harder right now, not easier. It's not serving its purpose. But it's not that we don't have software innovation. So that we have somewhat costlier and more uncertain software innovation. And in part, we do that by, by putting our heads in the sand uh, and just going on and innovating. And then, you know, when we get sued, we get sued. Uh, and I think you may see some of that in robotics, too. That is, one of the practical limits on overbroad IP protection is uh, there are a lot of I innovative engineers out there who are just going to go out and do something because it's cool and the world needs it, uh, and they're not going to go ask their patent lawyer first, should I do research in this area? And that might turn out to be a good thing. Those are, by the way, those are the best clients. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they will. They will uh, we had a, we had a client for a long time who shall remain unnamed who was, who, was, who was in a very precarious technological area and a very precarious position within the area, and they had to keep coming up with new stuff in order to stay alive. And they were making a ton of money. And they just went, just absolutely, they were just absolutely fearless. And then they just charged ahead and then they, they did all kinds of crazy stuff, not just related to IP, like just in generally they were just, and then they would just go to their lawyers and they would come, they would come to their lawyers and, and they would come to us and they would say, okay, we're in trouble again. And, and fix it and then send us the bill. Oh God, I miss those guys. <laughs> I, I really quickly want to build on something Mark was saying, um, and I think it's really important. I think he makes a good point that if you've got a lucrative enough business model, you're going to find a way to make it work. You know, IP law be damned, and that's not who I'm most concerned about. I'm concerned about the people who maybe don't have the model that's obviously lucrative, or maybe they're a hobbyist, or maybe they're a tinkerer in their basement who, you know, goes to their day job and at night comes home because they love this stuff, and they've got some great idea that no one in this room has thought of yet, you know, that no one has thought of. And it's those people that we really want to protect, I think, because they really have the potential to, number one, come up with some really great stuff, but number two, be squelched, you know, have, have their, their potential kind of squelched by these really oppressive um, IP laws. Because the other thing that, you know, we've talked a little bit about today, but I want to be clear about is, is you can find ways to navigate these things if you've got a lot of money. And, you know, that's pretty much what you guys are saying. But if, if you don't have a lot of money and you can't afford lawyers, then got a big problem on your hands and you face potentially a lot of liability personally. So I just kind of want to throw that out there without, you know, much else to say about it other than I think it's important to think about and I think as a community it makes sense for the robotics industry to really embrace those people um, and not shut them out because we've seen that to some extent in the smartphone world. The patent thicket surrounding smartphones is so extreme that um, with the exception of app developers, you don't really see a lot of small players anymore. And that's unfortunate for innovation. Let me follow up on that, Julie. Um, it's a little bit of a topic change, but that was a great segue. Um, you know, I think robotics is, is such a broad field that co covers so many different industries, you know, healthcare, consumer products, um, that, that the potential for there to be um, a huge range of patents in this field is there, and, and it already exists. And so, as sort of a practical or pragmatic question, um, how can people deal with that from a freedom to operate standpoint, um, you know, or patent analysis standpoint? Um, you know, what kind of problems is that going to create? So the first thing I would say, and this sounds so simple, is to make sure to talk to each other, to make sure that you. Part of what um, a lot of the more unsavory actors, particularly the patent trolls, benefit from 
is the fact that no one knows what they're doing. So let's say you get a scary letter in the mail that's like, um, you know, you're infringing my patent, send me, you know, $50,000 in the licensing fee. But you don't know if anyone else has gotten that letter. You don't know if that troll is actually suing. So it's really hard to make some kind of risk assessment. And so to the extent that you can talk to people and create community around these issues, that's really helpful. Sharing information is, you know, sharing power, which is trite, but true. Um, the other thing about that is, is if you talked a little bit earlier about prior art and re-examining patents, um, I'm all, and you know, EFF has done this a lot with a bunch of different patents, make that information public. Say, we think this patent, you know, or this family of patents has problems, and here's all this prior art we think that proves this family of patent has um, problems. And, and give people tools to fight back. So I don't, you know, I don't want to sound just kind of, like I said, trite, and you should all talk to each other, but there is, um, there are a lot of benefits that come from knowing what's really happening out there. Question? Just to add to that, um, I know there are sort of companies out there and databases where you can obtain information, like where I work, Lex Machia, um, is actually one where you can, you know, you can, you can find out exactly, you get a letter from some. Lex, Lex, the comment is uh, uh, there are sources of information that can answer the questions Julie's asking, right? Do these people sue? What happens? Uh, and he calls out one particular source, which I will, uh, in my advertising hat, uh, definitely mention, which is Lex Machina, which is the company I started here in 2006 that does uh, patent data and analytics. Um, and we're working on ways, too, I should say. That's not, not all of it's public, but we're working um, on internally at EFF and with a broader community of people, more ways to, you know, give people platforms to share and to make more information public, and we keep working on it. So, um, you know, continue to follow our work, too, and hopefully we'll get somewhere on that. Um, just, just also to f sort of follow up on all this, um, one thing I've thought about as, as a, maybe an alternative uh, to, to patenting or, or seeking, you know, sort of um, strong IP rights um, is the, the possibility of just publishing and the benefits of publishing, right, to, to the industry in terms of creating prior art and, and other things. And do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I do, actually. I think that's a really important point because what we've seen, part of the problems we saw in, in the open source world was that um, a lot of the, the work the open source world did when they were ignoring patents has been lost. Um, it's really hard to find, it's really hard to use for prior art, and that's unfortunate because a lot of it happened, and you know, it's on some hard drive in someone's garage, it hasn't been turned on in 20 years, and no one knows. So to the extent um, things are organized, things are made public, maybe there's um, a community-run wiki or a database or something, I think that can be of uh, great benefit down the road, first of all, in invalidating other patents and, and, and also just um, in creating a record of what's going on. Um, so we, we've got about five minutes left. I wanted to just see if there's questions. If not, we, we've got one or two other topics that we can hit on. But if anyone has questions, I wanted to get them before we wrap up. No, nothing. Okay. Um, so w w another question I have is just sort of um, with respect to litigation in th this this field. Um, you know, there's already 
been, I think, a lot of, of litigation, and, and as a successful field, it's inevitable that, that it's going to grow, that there's going to be more IP litigation. Um, do you have any um, thoughts about the types of litigation? Do you think this is a field that's going to see, uh, in the short term, a lot more competitive type um, litigation, or is this a field that's going to be um, get sort of uh, inundated with NPE-type uh, lawsuits? Uh, does anyone have any thoughts about that? You know, my sense is, is um, you know you're doing well in, uh, in a high-tech world when people start suing you, um, uh, right? That's a sign that your business is taking off. Uh, congratulations. Um, so, you know, as, as robotics takes off, I think we should expect uh, more litigation. Um, you know, in part, I think the question of is it going to be troll litigation or is it going to be uh, uh, competitor litigation is a function, again, of the business model, right? So, you know, how uh, narrowly defined is my and, and specific is my robotics technology, right? Is, is this, there are three companies in the world who make uh, robotic arms for manufacturing uh, uh, car doors, uh, and that might or might not be a patent troll mar lucrative market, but probably not a huge one uh, for a focus for them. Um, as you move away from uh, the specific and towards the general, two things happen. I think you get a lot more potentially relevant patents, um, and those patents are dispersed in lots of different hands. That makes it less likely to see a competitor suit, right? So the reason we rarely see competitor suits in the semiconductor industry, in the computer hardware industry, the smartphone case being a notable exception for reasons we can talk about, is, um, is the phenomenon of mutually assured destruction. Right? If you're old enough to remember the Cold War, uh, uh, we didn't end up blowing each other up in a nuclear holocaust uh, because I had so many nuclear weapons that if you attacked me, I could destroy you, and you had so many nuclear weapons that uh, if uh, I attacked you, you could destroy me. That turns out to be true of patents, too. Right? And so the, the companies who started uh, in the semiconductor industry suing each other, um, sure enough found out that, yep, I got a lot of patents that you infringe, but you got a lot of patents that I infringe. There's a fabulous case uh, from Western Texas uh, in the early 90s where um, two uh, Japanese semiconductor companies sued each other. The district court's, uh, district judge said, yeah, well, seems like you got valid patents. I'm just going to grant preliminary injunctions against both of you. Uh, neither of you can sell products, and sure enough, the party settled shortly thereafter. Um, <laughs> And I think that phenomenon ends up happening in the, in the uh, world where there are lots of patents that, that potentially read on technology. So for general purpose technologies or technologies that are loaded with a lot of software, that's going to be true. Those are also the technologies where you're more likely to see troll suits because there are a lot of other patents out there in the hands of trolls who don't have that mutually assured destruction initiative. Right? They're, the, they're the rogue states or, or individuals in the, in the mutually assured destruction world. Um, I don't know where they live. I can't uh, threaten to retaliate against them, and so the costs are asymmetric. Yeah, so my, and again, also, we yeah. were talking earlier about, it depends also on where the technology is, right? The technology that is in the manufacturing of robots, costly and difficult to identify infringement and to, and to prove up infringement. The technology that is in the robot that you can buy for $3 million, costly and difficult to analyze in order to figure out infringement. The, the technology that is in the robot that you can buy for $100 at the store, much less difficult to go to the store and buy it and analyze it for infringement. So, so uh, that's also the other place where once the, once the patents are on the stuff that is in everybody's, it's going to be in everybody's hands, that's when you'll see a lot. So I think uh, we're out of time. Um, I just want to say thank you to our panelists. Um, they, I think they did a fantastic job and made my job very easily. Uh, and thank you all for, for coming. And, Ryan? Yeah, thank you so much. This was really great. Um, thanks for the...